All right, thank you for that, Miss Morgan. All right, church family, take your Bibles, if you would, to the Gospel of John, chapter number 15. The Gospel of John, chapter number 15, is where we are going to be. We're going to pick up uh, from last week, John, chapter number 15. We're going to read from verses number 18 down to the end of the chapter. John, chapter number 15, begin reading verse number 18. If you're there and you're physically able, out of honor and respect for the reading of God's word, let's, let's stand, shall we? <clears throat> John, chapter number 15, verse number 18. The Bible says this. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have per persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will also keep yours also. They will keep yours also. But all things, verse 22. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I do not come and, and spoke unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass that the, the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the comforter is come, when I will send unto you from the father, even the spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness because ye have been with me from the beginning. The title of this message is this, What a Witness Should Expect. What a Witness Should Expect. Let's have a word of prayer and then you can be seated. Lord, we thank you, dear God, for this day. Lord, we want to thank you, dear God, for your word. Lord, please forgive us, Lord, of times where we fail you, Lord, on a regular basis. Lord, I fail you on a regular basis. So, Lord, I pray that you would just help us, dear God, just to glean from your word this morning. Lord, thankful for the time of fellowship, thankful for the time of music and and Lord, what a blessing and encouragement that's been, Lord. And, and Lord, I do ask you Lord, now that you would just, as the word is open, that you would make yourself so real to us and that we would glean the, the truths of your word, that we might leave here desiring, Lord, to serve you better and to love you more. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. I pray that you just be with us now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> I want to be clear when I say this, and I have no apologies when I say it, the Christian life is the best life to live. The Christian life, it really is the best life to live. You know, I think of, oh, a gentleman, I don't know if many of you, some of you might know him by the name of Dennis J. Brown. I don't know if anybody familiar with Brother Brown. Uh, maybe yeah, Brother Dylan knows him. Brother Wayne might know him, just a couple. Not, not really. Uh, we, yeah, he, he's a, a famous preacher. I say famous, but I don't want, I don't want to use the word famous. Kind of just brings kind of a negative connotation with the word famous. But, but anyways, he, he was a preacher who went home to be with the Lord. And at, at the, the college I attended, there was a dorm that was named after him, Brown Dorm. And there in Brown Dorm, there's a little, uh, little plaque of him. And then just gives a little bit about his life. And then uh, Brother Brown, he was very much into church planting and uh, loved the Lord, a good preacher. And, and on his deathbed, I remember, I, I remember reading it, and on his deathbed, he said this to his wife. I think the Lord was just kind of giving him just a little bit of a glimpse of heaven. And, and he said this, he said, now he said his wife's name, I can't remember his wife's name, but he said, it's just like we preach about. And then he went off into glory. It's just like how we preach about it. And then he went off into heaven. Now, you, you, you know, you don't see preachers who, or you don't see Christians who gave their life to the Lord, and on their deathbed they said this, I really wish I'd uh, used my time more wisely than being devoted to Christianity. You know, you really don't see that. You, you don't hear about that. 
But, but what we do here is that we do hear people that who are, or maybe they're on their deathbed and they're getting, they know that they're getting ready to step into eternity. We probably hear more of things like, I wish I'd have done more. I wish I'd have loved Jesus more. I wish I'd have served him better. I wish I, I somehow, some way, I was more devoted to him. I wish I had done more for the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, hey listen, and when, when, when death happens, it's like eternity just becomes a little bit more real, even to those who are close to those who have died. You know, heaven just becomes a little bit more real. But, but, but listen, I, I say all that to say this. The best life to live is the obedient Christian life. That is the best life you can live. Listen, we only got one shot at life. Did you know that? There's no do-overs. There's no redos. There, 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 there's no second chances. We got one life to live, and the best way to live it is the obedient Christian life. Yeah. But listen, we also got to understand something else. When we live the Christian life, we're living a life that goes contrary to the culture of the world. It goes in the opposite direction to just the flow of culture to live the Christian life. Now, when Jesus called his disciples to follow him, listen, Jesus wasn't calling a prosperity gospel. He wasn't giving a prosperity gospel. Listen, Jesus wasn't saying, you come follow me and your life will be happy. He didn't say that. No, listen, I believe that there is happiness in following the Lord Jesus, okay? But he didn't say, you follow me and all your problems will go away. He didn't say, you follow me and everybody will love you. No, in, in all actuality, he said the exact opposite. Because what did he tell his disciples? Look at verse number 18. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before the world hated you. You know what Jesus is saying? Expect to be hated. That's what he's saying there. He, listen, Jesus, at this point, he's trying to prepare them. Jesus is uh, moments away from being arrested. He's moments away of... And this is him prior going to the garden and praying, and then, and then he would be arrested and then tried and, and then executed for sure, uh, or, or crucified. But, but this is Jesus, and he's trying to let them know that in his absence, they should not expect friendliness to come from the world. They shouldn't expect that. In all actuality, they should expect troubles. They should expect uh, hatred. They should expect persecution. And the reason why they should expect that is because the world hated Jesus. That's why. He says, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Hey, listen, Jesus had his followers, didn't he? He did. I mean, Jesus, Jesus even knew how to draw a crowd. And there, there was multiple times where there was multitudes of people that were flocking around Jesus. And, the, and we're reminded of the time when Jesus was going into Jerusalem. And that there were people that were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Remember that? And they were taking off their garments and they were laying down palm branches. And so everyone was shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the king in the name of the Lord. But listen, also understand that very same crowd was the one that was agitated by the Pharisees to also cry out, crucify him. So yes, Jesus could draw a crowd. But overall, Jesus was saying this, the world hates me. So therefore, disciples, you shouldn't be surprised when the world hates you as well. Listen, the, the only ones that the world loves are the ones who belong to the world. Look at verse 19 there. Hey, keep your Bibles open. Listen, hey church, it's important that you keep your Bibles open because I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to see God's word. All right, so keep your Bibles open. Look, look at verse number 19. It says, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. The world would love his own. What, what, what does that mean? Well, his own, that, that speaks to like the, the interests of the world. That speaks of the attitudes of the world. That speaks of the habits of the world. Uh, basically, the, world, the, the, the ones that the world will love are the ones that, who have the same interests as the world, the same habits as the world, the, the same attitudes as the world. Listen, Jesus Christ said this, I'm not of this world. Didn't he say that? He said, I'm not of this world. But instead, he said this, he even said this to the Pharisees. I'm from above. So, so listen, Jesus' attitude, Jesus' interests, Jesus' habits, they're not of this world. They're contrary to this world. So therefore, since his attitudes, habits, interests, since they go contrary to the world, the world's going to hate him. And Jesus told them because uh, that he's not of this world. Now look at verse uh, 19 again. 
about the second part there. It says, but because ye are not of, because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. Jesus told them this, told the disciples, you're not of this world either. What does that mean? Well, I'm pretty sure I, 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 I know who I'm preaching to here this morning. So I don't, I'm not going to go into a, a too extensive labor in this. But if you study the word of God, the believer who puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, their citizenship is not here. Their citizenship is in heaven. Hey, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Okay, so here's Jesus. and He says, I have chosen you. Okay, now real quick. I, uh, let's not jump to conclusions and let's not jump to the false notion that Jesus only chooses certain people to go to heaven. Listen, that is a damnable doctrine that goes on in the world today. Listen, if the fact of the matter is this, Jesus chooses everybody. Jesus chooses everybody to receive the gift of eternal life. Now, listen, people have the responsibility to receive that gift but, but still, nonetheless, Jesus is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the main point that Jesus is making to his disciples is that since they are not of the world, since their citizenship is in heaven, that would mean that their citizenship, their, the citizenship of their interests, the citizenship regarding their, their, their philosophies or points of view, it goes contrary to the world. So Jesus says, because you're not of the world, just like I'm not of this world, then you can expect to be hated on. Am I making sense? Okay. And then he also said this, that the disciples, they could also expect persecution. Look at verse 20. Verse number 20. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they also will keep yours, or keep yours also. Jesus is saying, Hey, don't be surprised if you're persecuted because I'm persecuted. And then he also went on to say that they kept his sayings. Now, okay, what does that mean? At the end of verse number 20, it says, if they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. Now, if we're not careful, we can misread that in, into thinking that saying that the world will keep his sayings and obey his sayings. But, but that's not what that means there. When the Bible says that they will keep his sayings, that gives the idea of this, observing with intention to be critical. You ever known anybody to do that? Always watching for something to criticize. The Pharisees constantly did that towards Jesus, didn't they? Every time Jesus taught, every time Jesus preached, the Pharisees, they weren't that far behind. And listen, they were listening, but they weren't listening to, for intention that the Holy Ghost would speak to their hearts. No, no, no. They were listening for him to slip up in some way, shape, or form so they can say, ha, we got him. They're intentionally on the lookout. They're intentionally listening to him. Uh, do you remember when there was the lame man who was lowered through Peter's roof? Yeah. Jesus was there, and the Bible says that the house was full, and Jesus was teaching, and he was preaching. Boy, wouldn't you like to have Jesus in your living room? Yeah. Would you invite everybody you know? Some of you would. <laughs> Jesus is there. He's sitting in Peter's living room. And all of a sudden, we, we know that there was the lame man who had four friends. They couldn't get through the door because it was just so crowded. So what they did is they had to go up onto the roof. And then they had to break apart the roof and, and to lower him down. And then what did Jesus say? Jesus said that he saw their faith. And then he says, thy sins be forgiven thee. But you know who else was there? The Pharisees. The Pharisees were there. And then this is what they were doing. They were gossiping in their own little corner. And they said this. Did he really just say he has the power to forgive sins? Who has the authority to forgive sins except God? Bingo. Bingo. See, they knew the answer, but they didn't know the answer. Who has the authority to forgive sins except God? So you know what they were doing? They were, they were there, but they weren't there to receive the word. They were there to be critical. And so what Jesus, he's telling his disciples in this passage, he says, hey, if they're going to keep my words, if they're going to criticize and observe and listen intently to try to trap me with my words, then they're going to try to trap you with your words as well. That's what he's saying. So the big question would just simply be this. 
What did Jesus do to deserve the hatred? What did he do? What did Jesus do so that the world would hate him? What did he do for the religious world, the Judaizers, the, the Pharisees to hate him? Now, obviously, what we, we would say, he didn't do anything wrong. I mean, even Pilate looked at him and said, I find no guilt in this man. So the question is, why in the world would the world hate Jesus and also hate the disciples of Jesus? Why would they do that? Well, listen, this is the reason why the world hated Jesus, because Jesus revealed truth. That's it. Because Jesus revealed truth. Listen, he revealed the truth about their sin. Look at verse 22. Look there. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. All right, now, th this verse can seem a little confusing, okay? If, if we read this verse, we, we can make it seem like if Jesus hadn't come, then the world would have been innocent from sin. But since Jesus came, now the world is guilty of sin. We can misinterpret it that way. But we need to get the overall context of what he's talking about. No, Jesus is saying this. Hey, they're, they've persecuted me. They've rejected me. They've hated me. So the idea is that, listen, if Jesus had not have come, then they would not have been guilty of rejecting him. Does that make sense? But now continue reading verse number 22. But now they have no cloak for their sin. <laughs> Let's read all of 22. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. You know what Jesus did when he was there? When he spoke, this is what he did. It's like he uncovered all of their sin. Their sins can't, they can't hide their sins anymore. You know who are the really, really good at hiding their sin? Religious people. You know who are really, really good at hiding their sin? churchgoers. They're good at it. They can hide it. They can play the game. But listen, no one's pulling the wool over Jesus' eyes. No one's pulling the wool over his eyes. No, no, no. Jesus saw them for who they really were, and he confronted them, and he called them whited sepulchers. Why did sepulchers, what is that? Why, did, why would Jesus call the religious people whited sepulchers? Well, a sepulcher is where they would bury dead people. And why did it just gives the idea that it's pretty, a pretty place to where there were a pretty tomb where they would lay dead people. And so Jesus says, you're just like whited sepulchers on the outside. You look like you got it all together on the outside. You're, you look very nice on the outside. You look like you're very, very spiritual, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. On the inside, you're dead because of your sin. And what Jesus did is that he revealed their sins with his words. They couldn't hide it anymore. He gave truth. That's what he did. And when he gave truth, the religious world of Judaism hated him for it. Yep. And then also he did this. Jesus revealed truth about who he was through his works. Hey, verse 24. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. It's kind of the same idea there. Except this time, Jesus is not talking about his words. This time, Jesus is talking about his works. Listen, no one will be able to surpass the works that Jesus did. No one. I mean, what are some of the things that Jesus did here? I mean, we could spend all day. I mean, the Gospel of John tells us that the books, that there's not enough books in the world that can contain all the works that Jesus did. So we would be here a long time, okay? But we could just talk about a few. What did he do? He fed multitudes. He fed thousands multiple times. He healed multitudes. He healed diseases. He healed the lame. He healed the blind. He walked on water. He has power over creation itself. He walked on water and not only did he do that, but when there's storms, he said, peace be still. And then the, the, the storm, the, the sea just became like glass. Uh, he, he healed the blind man. He cast out demons. He raised a rotting corpse from the dead. Is what he's done. Listen, all the works that Jesus had done, no one, even in the Old Testament, even the Old Testament prophets, do not compare to the works that he had done. Moses. Moses. Parting of the Red Sea. 
Now, we know Moses didn't do it. We know that it was God doing that. But still, even the accounts of Moses didn't even compare to what Jesus has done. How about this? The prophet Elijah. Remember him? Okay, in case you didn't, what Elijah would do is, Elijah, he was so close to God that he'd pray and fire came down and consumed an altar. What a prayer life you have to have. To pray, and all of a sudden fire come down and poof. Some of you are thinking that you would pray that on someone else's car. So. <laughs> Elijah. The Bible tells us that Elijah was able to take off his garment and that he was able to smack the waters and smack the river and then the river would part. What a relationship he had with God. But listen, no one compares to what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. No one compares to what he was able to do. And listen, all of the works that Jesus did, all of those miracles, none of those works were to be braggadocious. None of those works were to say, hey, look what I've done. None of those works were, were, uh, were selfish motives. No, no, no. All of the works that Jesus had done were simply for one purpose, to confirm who he is. To confirm that the message that he brings is truth. In other words, all of those works, raising of the dead, walking on the water, calming the storms, healing the blind, casting out the demons, feeding the multitudes, all those things were to just convey this truth. Jesus is God. To convey that truth. His words convey truth. And his works convey truth. But this is what happened. They hated him. Because of truth. Yeah. That's what happened. You know the, the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is just what it reveals. It reveals that they didn't know the father. It reveals that. Listen, you, you can't have a relationship with the Father and not have a relationship with Jesus. Can't be done. You, you, you cannot, the, the Pharisees could not say that they loved God and yet still at the same time hated Jesus. Couldn't be done. But, but, but what we see here is that in verse number 24, look at verse number 24. He says, if I had not done, the, uh, done among them the works which uh, none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. So listen, if because the Pharisees and the religious leaders and the religious crowd, because they hated Jesus, because they did that, then listen, they're also hating the father. Everybody with me? They're hating him too. Listen, this is all they did. Let me have your attention. All Jesus did was this, give truth. That's all Jesus did. Was just give truth. Give truth about sin. Give truth about his works. Give truth about his person. And they hated him. Now, even though the world's response to truth would be hatred, Jesus knew that even after he ascended up into heaven, truth still needed to go forth. Even though Jesus was going to be gone, even though Jesus was going to ascend into heaven after his resurrection, he was going to die, be buried, resurrect, and then go up into heaven, truth still needed to be proclaimed, does it not? And because tr truth still needed to be proclaimed, he's telling his disciples this, you're going to be hated for it. Ain't that encouraging? You have to do a job, but by the way, people are going to hate you. You have to do a job, but by the way, people are going to persecute you. But this is what Jesus does. He tells them, that he was going to send a comforter to help the disciples as they proclaim truth. Look at verse 26. But when the comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth. Jesus said he was going to send a comforter. Now the word comforter in the Greek, it means this. To come alongside of and to assist. To come alongside of and to assist. And the one who's going to come alongside of and to assist is going to be the Spirit of truth. Listen, that's the Holy Spirit of God. Now, we talked about it this morning in Sunday school, that one of the main roles of the Spirit of God is to do this. Always reveal truth. Always point to truth. That's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit of God. Listen, Jesus said this, I am the way, the what? Truth and the life. The Holy Spirit of God is to do this. Point people to the Savior. 
point people to Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit of God is going to do. All right, now listen. Don't let, let's not get this false notion in our minds here. There might be people out in the world today that might think this, that the Holy Spirit is just kind of floating out there. He's just kind of floating out there, and when Joe Schmo is walking down the street, the Holy Spirit will just come upon them, and all of a sudden, there is a whole new aura of truth that has been revealed to me. That's not the case. That's not how the Spirit of God works. Everybody with me so far? How many of you are surprised that that's not how the Spirit of God works? Okay. So, so listen, you're not going to be walking down the street, and then all of a sudden the Spirit of God is going to come upon you and be just like, I've just been illuminated to the truth. I've just been illuminated to the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. No, that's not how it works. Look at what Jesus said. Jesus said that he would send the comforter unto them. Unto them. The Spirit of God is going to assist them. Does that make sense? Look at verse number 27. It says, Ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. This is the idea. Jesus is going to ascend into heaven, but truth still needs to be proclaimed. Truth still needs to be preached. Truth still needs to be told. But listen, they're going to be hated for truth. They're going to be persecuted for truth's sake. But Jesus says this, I'm going to send my spirit that comes from the Father to you to assist you. That even though you're going to be hated, and even though you're going to be persecuted, and even though you're going to be even martyred at the time, listen, even though you're going to be hated by this world, truth still needs to go out. Truth still needs to be proclaimed but I'm going to give you the spirit so that he can sustain you and make sure that truth continues to go forth. We fast forward to 2,000 years later, and here we are in Sterling, Colorado. 2,000 years later, halfway around the world, guess what? Truth still needs to go forth. Truth still needs to be preached. Truth still needs to be taught. But listen, if we're going to preach truth and teach truth, and witness for truth, listen, you're going to need assistance. That's where the Holy Spirit of God comes in. Well, why are you going to need assistance? Because this is the thing. You go preach truth. You go teach truth. You teach truth that goes contrary to the world. Listen, you're going to be hated. No, no, no. Don't act like it's a shock. Jesus says, you're going to be hated. Jesus says, you're going to be persecuted. But here's the thing. Truth still needs to go forth. Truth still needs to be preached. Truth still needs to be proclaimed. You know, I, I think of, listen, there are Christians all over the world that are persecuted for truth's sake. Is this thing on, Brother Trevor? We're blessed to live in America. No, come on. You live here. We're blessed to live in this country. We absolutely are blessed. You know, there, there, I, I did some research this past, uh, as I'm studying here, and, 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 I, and I, I found this, uh, some, some information that re, kind of records just some of uh, what Christians have gone through just around the world just this past year, 2022. In 2022, a, a man from North Korea prison camp was beaten unconscious, then awakened just to be beaten some more. Well, why is that? For truth. In just this past year, 2022, there has been 5,898 Christians killed for their faith. 5,110 5, churches and other Christian buildings were attacked this past year in 2022. 4,765 believers detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and in prison just this past year. Hey, listen, this year's not over yet either. I assure you the number's still growing. Well, why? Well, why? For truth. For truth. All they're doing is sharing truth. Now it kind of makes us wonder, makes us think. Why in the world would anybody want to give truth? Why would anybody on the world, in the world want to share truth? 
Why would anybody in the world would want to proclaim the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ? Why in the world would they do that? Listen, if it leads to the beatings, if it leads to the punishments, if it leads to the hatred, and it leads to the persecutions, why in the world would people be willing to surrender and leave the blessings that they have of the American of the United States of uh, the United States of America? There, I'll get it out. Why in the world would they leave this blessed country to go into a foreign nation where they know that they could possibly lose their lives for truth's sake? Why in the world would they do that? Because this, because when people die without truth, the judgment that they'll face is a whole lot worse than the judgment that we face here in this in this life. When people die without truth, the judgment that they'll face is an eternal judgment. So therefore, truth needs to be proclaimed. You with me? Truth needs to be proclaimed. Truth needs to be preached. Truth needs to be taught. It needs to. Hey, listen, church family. I think this should encourage us to do this even more. Pray for our missionaries. We need to be praying for them. Listen, there, there were some missionaries that had to uh, have come on off the field, but there were some other missionaries that we've supported that we weren't even allowed to read their prayer letters online just because we might jeopardize them. We might put them in harm's way. But, but why in the world would they leave America to go to those types of countries? For truth's sake. But, but here's the thing. God just doesn't call them to share truth. God calls us to share truth. God just doesn't call the pastors to preach truth. No, God calls the church to proclaim truth. God calls the church. God calls each and every one of us. Listen, if you're saved and you're a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit of God with inside of you. Listen, it's our job to make sure that we share the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with people we come in contact with. But, but I don't know. I, I don't know, Brother Richard. I, I just can't do that. I can't do that. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to articulate it into words. I, I don't know. I mean, sometimes I, I, I just get too scared at times. Hey, we're all human. We all get scared. How many of you have been scared to share the gospel with somebody? If you're not raising your hands, you're, you're a liar or asleep. Okay. No, no, no. Come on now. We, we all have that fear. We all, have, we all worry about when it comes to sharing the gospel with people. But, but, but listen, fear shouldn't hinder us from proclaiming truth. Fear shouldn't be an obstacle that's in our way that stops us from proclaiming truth. But listen, if all we ever say is, well, I can't do that. Well, that's not my personality. Well, I just, I'm afraid that I, I'm just not like you. I can't talk in front of people. I just can't do that. No, those are excuses. Well, how dare you say it's an excuse? Well, this is how I dare. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit of God to assist you. You have the Holy Spirit of God to come alongside you. Jesus knows it's hard. Jesus knows that you struggle with it. Jesus knows that it's an obstacle that you might deal with. But here's the thing. The same spirit of God that he gave those disciples to turn the world upside down for the gospel's sake. Is the same spirit of God that he gives missionaries around the world to continue to proclaim truth as they're in hostile territory. Listen, that's the same spirit of God that resides in you so that you might be able to be brave enough to share the gospel at work. Share the gospel at school. Tell someone about Christ in the classroom. To tell someone about Christ at the, the grocery store. To be bold enough to give out just the gospel track there at Walmart. Or as you go through the drive through to invite someone in the drive through at work. And, 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 and they look like they're part of the world. Listen, it's the same spirit of God that dwells in those believers. It's the same spirit of God that dwells in those missionaries. Hey, if you're saved and you're born again, it's the same spirit of God that dwells inside you. And he's able to assist you. He's able to come alongside you and be able to make sure that you are able to proclaim truth as well. Yeah. Now listen. Here's what you can expect. Hatred. Isn't that encouraging? Hatred. <laughs> Once again, praise God for America. Hey, listen, you know what we should do? We should, take a, we should take advantage of the freedoms that we have right now to be loud with the gospel. 
We should take advantage of the freedoms that we have now to be bold with the gospel, to, to be willing to talk to people about the Lord Jesus Christ in the public settings. Because, listen, there are nations around the world today that don't have that freedom. Listen, there are churches around the world today that, that assemble. Uh, basically, they have an underground church. They, 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 uh, you know, it's encouraging when we see visitors come into the church. It is encouraging to see new faces and, and to greet them and to shake their hands. That's encouraging. But, but do you know that there are, are churches halfway around the world that when they see a new visitor, they're cautious. And they don't know. Are, are they from the government? Are, 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 are they going to snitch on us? Are, 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 are we going to be shut down? Are we going to be persecuted? Are we going to be arrested tonight? What's going to happen? No, listen. We should praise God that we live in this nation. We're not perfect by any means, but praise God we still have the freedom to stand here and preach truth to people. And listen, the same Spirit of God that dwells in the apostles, the same Spirit of God that dwells in our missionaries that are in hostile territory, dangerous lands, is the same Spirit of God that dwells in you just so that you might be willing to do this. Take the gospel just across the street. Take the gospel, take truth down the road. Take truth to the community of what Sterling, Colorado is. Listen, people need to hear truth about sin. They need to know the truth about sin. Truth is glamorized. Truth, uh, I, mean, I mean, sin is glamorized, excuse me. Sin is glamorized. Sin is, uh, is considered something to be accepted. Sin is being considered as normal. But, but listen, people need to know the truth about sin. It's because of sin that we fall short of the glory of God. So people need to know the truth about sin. And also, once they realize that they're lost and they realize that the truth about sin, then they need to know the truth about the Savior. And who he is and his works, what he'd accomplished. Not just talking about how he healed the blind. Not just talking about how he walked on water. No, but the finished work, what he did on the cross of Calvary. How he, how, he, how he lived and he died and he was buried. And three days later, he resurrected again. Hey, praise God for the resurrection. If there is no resurrection, then we have no gospel truth. So praise God for the resurrection. L listen, the people need to know truth. But even though you give truth and you have the Holy Spirit of God to assist you in truth... Expect hatred. Because you're going against the flow of the culture. You're going against the flow of the world. So expect hatred. Brother Richard, I don't know if I want to do that then. Jesus knew. Did you, Jesus knew that when he came to this earth, his whole purpose was to die. But he still came. He still came. He knew what he was going to face. But he still came. Listen, Jesus is being very transparent. I'm not trying to portray some false gospel here. No, 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 no. Listen, I'm trying to be as very real to you as Jesus was with his disciples. If you're going to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, expect animosity. Expect persecution. Expect hatred. But as you experience that, know this. You have the Holy Spirit of God there to assist you. But also, you need to also understand this. Truth is worth it. Truth is worth it. Because there's going to come a day where we stand in front of him. When we're in glory. No, th this life is temporal. Th 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 this, is, this, is, this is not forever here. There will be a day when we stand in front of him. And he's going to ask us, what did we do with truth? Did we just keep it to ourselves? Are we willing to share it? At Calvary Baptist Church, let's be a church that shares truth. We might be hated for it. We might be persecuted for it. But we got to remind ourselves this. Truth is always worth it. Truth is worth it. Father, we thank you.